So, I'm Patty Bruner, and uh, we're continuing our series on the armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14 says, Stand fast with your loins girded in truth, clothed with righteousness as a breastplate. Well, certainly the Lord wants us to understand the breastplate of righteousness. Guarding your heart is so important to Christians to help uh, give you from giving your heart, to help you from giving your heart to false gods. The Lord says, I am who am. And His righteousness restores purity to those who've looked the other way and may have been enticed by wealth and power and pleasure. The yoke of righteousness looks to the perfect obedience of Jesus. And when your own fails, and that allows restitution, rest, restoration. The sacrament of reconciliation actually takes up the breastplate and keeps our heart guarded from the effects of sin. And not alone can man do this, only in Christ. Tonight we're going to take a quick look at spiritual warfare and spiritual attack. Then we'll explore righteousness and how it is delivered to us, how we lose it, and how it is restored to us. And then we'll talk about the benefit of guarding your heart with the breastplate of righteousness. So first, what is spiritual warfare and what does spiritual attack look like? Spiritual warfare is overcoming the threats harassments, and temptations of evil, and sharing the victory of Jesus Christ. Spiritual warfare defends against, protects from, and destroys spiritual attack. Let me repeat that. Spiritual warfare defends, protects, and destroys. Ephesians 6, chapter 6, verse 12 tells us that our struggle is not with flesh and blood, but with principalities, with the powers, with the world rulers of this present darkness, with the evil spirits of the heavens. We are overcoming the threats, harassments, and temptations of an enemy that we cannot see, that we cannot reason with, <coughs> who uses every dirty trick in the book trying to deceive us into believing his lies. Satan will continue to accuse us and harass us. However, we know from the book of Revelation in chapter 12 that he's conquered by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Let me share an, uh, an incident of spiritual attack. As many of you know, eight years ago, my husband had a battle with a diagnosis that caused for a heart transplant. And we won that battle. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Three years ago, Rick had a checkup with the local cardiologist who proceeded to tell us that one of the wires of his pacemaker, defibrillator, had come loose or was fractured and uh, it wasn't working and he he was real concerned about this and he told us that we were going to need to go back to St. Louis and have a, a long surgery to to put in a fresh wire and uh, the doctor left the room to consult with his uh, his clinic's pacemaker specialist and and at first, I was kind of thinking about the bother that we were going to have to go to St. Louis and go through all of that again. And, and, and then I thought, well, maybe this is a spiritual attack, much like this phone going off. <laughs> I, I thought I turned it off. you know how to turn it off? <laughs> and then it dawned on me to pray. It dawned on me to pray. And so we prayed for healing of that wire and for an expert to be found that could tell us that it was healed. So uh, a few minutes later, the tech specialist came back in the room and said she had actually called the manufacturer's specialist, his representative, who was in our area. 
Well, that was a quick answer to the prayer for the, for the expert. And so as we waited for him, I found this scripture in the book that I just happened to have with me. My God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Okay, so that's Philippians 4.19. I proclaimed it aloud several times. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So the expert showed up. He tweaked a setting. And everything worked fine. Amen. Amen. All three wires worked fine. So whether it was just a lie of Satan or the healing of a fractured wire, that's not important. The important thing is that we trusted God to take care of all of our needs, and he did. So two days later, I gave this talk. I was asked to give this talk. And so the enemy had actually tried to take us out and make us go to St. Louis, so I, I wasn't here to give the talk. So the winner again is Jesus. Amen. Is Jesus. So what are some of the ways that we can spot that we are in the midst of a spiritual attack? That's part of the problem is to be able to recognize that what's going on is a spiritual attack. Do you ever feel like you're talking to a brick wall when you're talking to someone who's an atheist or someone who's fallen away from their faith? Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 4 that the invisible rulers of darkness actually rise up in, with opposition to keep people from coming closer to him or to even hear about Jesus Christ. Going so far as to veil the minds of unbelievers so that they may not see the light of the gospel or the glory of Christ. Spiritual attack. A spiritual attack can make you feel accused and condemned and craving to be isolated in your misery. A spiritual attack can cause you to start to doubt God's goodness and make you want to throw a pity party for yourself instead. It involves lies and deceit. Remember, according to the Gospel of John, the enemy is the father of lies. Ephesians chapter 4 says a spiritual attack will sow a strong incentive to divide and separate you from other Christians. It also says a spiritual attack will try to talk you into staying angry and holding on to every hurt with deep resentment and unforgiveness. But in Hebrews, we are instructed that spiritual warfare that we wage as Christians is able to win the battle because of the armor of God that we put on is Christ. And Christ is the winner. To help us to be prepared to win each spiritual battle, we are to be protected with the full armor of God. We are called to trust God's armor and to be prayerful in every situation. And this is the overall use of spiritual warfare. Defense, protect, destroy. A key piece of the armor, and that's what we're going to discuss tonight, is the breastplate of righteousness. When opportunity meets the need of grace, God has allowed a path of righteousness to cross from eternity into the now. Let me say that again. When opportunity meets need, the grace of God has allowed the path of righteousness to cross from eternity into now. So what is righteousness? The church tells us in the Catechism, paragraph 1991, righteousness means the rectitude of divine love. The Catechism quotes Romans chapter 14 to state the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness is the wisdom of God. Righteousness is the holiness of God. And righteousness for man is the reconnection to God. 
So how do we get the righteousness of Christ? How do we get that connection? Romans 5, 19 says, For just as though and through the disobedience of one person, the many were made sinners, so through the obedience of the one, the many shall be made righteous. Righteousness belongs to God, and it is the gift of love that he gives to us. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So, how do we get the gift of love? The righteousness. What's the sacraments? The sacraments of baptism and reconciliation deliver the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The sacraments of baptism and reconciliation delivers the righteousness. In the Catechism, it says baptism, the sacrament of faith, conforms us to the righteousness of God, who makes us inwardly just by the power of His mercy. It also says the grace of the Holy Spirit confer upon us the righteousness of God, uniting us by faith and baptism to the passion and resurrection of Christ. The Spirit makes us sharers in His life. And we're reminded of this in every Eucharist. God's righteousness is bestowed on us as Christian holiness. The breastplate is Christ's righteousness, His holiness. Paul wrote to the Ephesians that Christ's disciples have put on the new man, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, we cannot fully understand the word righteousness because only Christ is righteous. And it is through Christ Jesus that the Father purifies man to receive righteousness into our own hearts. <clears throat> Only in the fullness of time will you get to know the Father fully. But to know Him is to love Him. And as you begin to know and thus love Him, your life will reflect that love and change you into a righteous man through the guidance and love of Jesus with the Holy Spirit. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. God continues to give his Son to you through all eternity. Each Holy Communion returns to the moment of extreme righteousness and obedience. So as we partake of the gift he has given, so that you can be one with him, and then he remains in you, and you in him. At that moment, at that moment, there's no one but Christ in the Father's eyes. As you become one with him in the Holy Communion, you are one with God. Baptism, confirmation, and holy orders last forever because they are sealed by the Holy Spirit. The church teaches us in Catechism, paragraph 1994, that justification is the most excellent work of God's love made manifest in Christ Jesus and granted by the Holy Spirit. I found it interesting that it was the opinion of St. Augustine that the justification of the wicked, now that's us, is a greater work than the creation of the heaven and earth. Let me say that again. The justification of the wicked, that's us, is a greater work than the creation of the earth and the heavens. Because heaven and earth will pass away, but the salvation and justification of the elect will not pass away. 
And St. Augustine also holds that the justification of sinners surpasses the creation of the angels. And so that justification bears witness to a greater mercy than the creation of angels. And that's probably why Satan hates us so much. You know, he's jealous. There's one baptism and it remains forever. So if, if baptism gives us righteousness and it lasts forever, then how do we lose righteousness? How do we lose it? Well, the enemy longs for you to deny and reject righteousness because that's the only way it can be penetrated. The enemy longs for you to deny and reject righteousness. The only way the breastplate of righteousness can be penetrated. The enemy can go after after everyone, you know? He went after Adam and Eve with his lies, and they took the bait, and they rejected the kingdom of God and God's righteousness. Satan tempted Christ. Satan tempted Christ to, in an attempt to get him to reject righteousness. We read in Matthew chapter 4 that Satan tried to get Jesus to forsake God and reject righteousness by turning all focus on things of this world, even though the things of this world were good things. Jesus answered with scripture, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. So how does the enemy use good things like work, family, homes, and food to tempt you. The devil said to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and with their hands they will support you, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. A test can cause us righteousness. To say God loves me so it doesn't matter what I do or say shows not reliance on God, but a testing of God's gift of free will. Satan hates free will. He hates that man can choose to follow God, despite knowing that he will suffer, that man will suffer at times in this world. Testing God is the person who commits mortal sin with the idea that since God is good and loving, he won't send anyone to hell. Testing God says, I don't really have free will thus making God the liar instead of the deceitful one, Satan. God does love you. He's always here to help you. However, he allows you to choose, even to choose sin and certain death. Then the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And in their magnificence, he said to them, all these I will give to you, if you will prostrate yourself and worship me. At this Jesus said to him, Get away, Satan. It is written, The Lord your God sh shall you worship, and him alone shall you serve. So the temptation to reject God for false gods, that seems like an obvious temptation to us, doesn't it? However, the chosen people of Israel fell for that one over and over and over. We have to ask ourselves what things, money, power, prestige, political correctness, sports, entertainment idols, you know, what does the enemy use to tempt us? The enemy longs for you to deny and reject righteousness. 
the only way the breastplate of righteousness can be penetrated is for us to reject it. So, how is righteousness restored after we mess up? Well, the sacrament of reconciliation. What a joy. When we choose to sin, we know something is wrong. But the enemy's there, justifying the sin to us, trying to get us to look the other way, to forget about it. And then the next sin is easier to swallow. In the long term, if without the sacrament of reconciliation, we don't even notice that our choices are offensive to God. But the consequence of sin affects us. It's like each sin is a clod of mud or feces that covers the breastplate. That's why the church reminds us of the seriousness of sin and the need to go to reconciliation. Reconciliation polishes the breastplate and removes the filth that accumulates so that it does not become so burdened with sin that you want to remove it because of its heaviness. Think about that. Caked with personal sin and bitterness, the breastplate seems to be the problem instead of the solution. It's weighted down with sin, and so we want to get rid of it. Have you ever felt lighter after going to confession? Absolutely. Yeah. So regular sacrament of reconciliation is the breastplate. It is the protection against the rejection of righteousness. Catechism paragraph 1848 reminds us to do its work, grace must uncover sin as to convert our hearts and bestow on us righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And like a physician who probes a wound before treating it, God by his word and by his spirit casts a living bite on sin. We can deny, we can reject grace by choosing to live in a state of mortal sin. But righteousness is easily restored by accepting grace and admitting sinfulness, choosing obedience in spite of failure. Father Rick Hobbs wrote about reconciliation, and he said that the, the sacrament exists not to show how bad we are, but how loving and gracious our Lord is for his people. A wonderful and great spiritual awakening is to have the weight of sin removed from your life. So remove the heavy gunk of sin. But don't take off the righteousness. Don't take off the breastplate. Moved by grace, man turns towards God and away from grace, thus accepting forgiveness and righteousness from on high. Praising God, praising God also shines the breastplate and repels the enemy. Like the ancient army of Israel, who polished their shields and reflected the sun to blind their enemy, finding God's glory in every situation and offering praise no matter what reflects the Son of God and thus repels the Prince of Darkness and all his cohorts that roam the earth seeking the ruin of souls. They hate the light, but love darkness. When King David was just a boy, you know, he was about to tackle the, the giant with a slingshot. And he took off the armor that, that King Saul had given him. Because King Saul's armor was of earthly power and pride. And so David was armed only with the confidence of the Lord 
and God provided all he needed to destroy his enemy, Goliath the giant. And God was given the glory by David. Glory and praise. You have the armor of righteousness at your baptism. So maintain that breastplate with frequent reconciliation and praise. Think for a moment about the benefits of guarding your heart with the breastplate of righteousness. How does the breastplate of righteousness protect us? Well, the shield of righteousness, the breastplate, protects the most vital organ in your body, the heart. The heart. So people can exist without arms and legs, even without brain function. But if you take a heart out without replacing it, you will die. And the enemy knows, and he's trying to get you to replace your heart with a heart of stone. The enemy wants you to become one of the walking dead. Mm -hmm. you know, but even a dead man walking, there is hope. There is hope. And God promises through the prophet Ezekiel, I will sprinkle clean water over you and make you clean from all your impurities. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will place within you, and I will remove the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. So when he sprinkles that clean water over it, doesn't that, that, he's talking about the coming of baptism. So in baptism, we are, our stony heart is taken away and we are given a heart of flesh, a new spirit, a new heart within us. The Israelites, Stone heart is caused by being rebellious and obstinate. They just couldn't trust God when things got hard. And a heart of flesh is susceptible and animated by God's Spirit. With the breastplate of righteousness, we are given the grace and the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, the enemy draws you ever inward and away from relationship with God. The enemy reminds you of how others have disappointed you and hurt you. The enemy wants you to harden your heart to stone so no one can get to you again, especially the Lord. And so basically, hardness of heart is a breastplate of self. So how do, you, how do you guard your heart from getting hurt? Well, to be vulnerable to love requires surrender. Not to sin, but to look past the imperfections of others. Put on Christ. Let Him be the perfect, the perfection of love. Guarding your heart is important to Christians to help you from giving your heart to false gods. In baptism, we make a covenant promise to forsake all others, like a marriage promise. So what happens after baptism if we have a roving eye? Well, Christ's righteousness restores purity to those who have looked the other way and have been enticed by wealth power and pleasure, and then the yoke of righteousness looks to Christ's perfect obedience when your own fails and allows restoration. The sacrament of reconciliation takes up the breastplate and keeps the heart guarded from the effects of sin. Not alone could man do this, only in Christ. So the breastplate protects you from the lie. To thine own self be true. Have you ever heard that line? It was given to Shakespeare at a time when man chose to listen to Shakespeare instead of listening to God. It reminds us that if you take the voice of the evil one and make it as your own, 
You can lose your soul as you remove your heart and give it away to the false gods of death and destruction. The breastplate of righteousness, which has defeated death, is always available 24-7. The Lord will guard you. Remain in His love. Remember what we said that what spiritual attacks look like. When the enemy seeks to deceive and destroy, he looks for legal ways that seem to be truth but are twisted. All of these are attacks on your heart. So when you experience opposition to keep people from coming close or even hearing about Jesus Christ, keep trying, keep trying knowing that your God can provide for all their needs in the richness of His glory. When you feel accused and condemned, or you crave to be isolated in your misery, have the fortitude to continue to trust in God's divine mercy. When you start to doubt God's goodness and want to throw a pity party for yourself, allow peace and recognize that God can bring good from evil and thus overcome it. When attacks involves lies and deceit, because the father of lies is Satan, the wisdom of God helps you to recognize truth. <laughs> when you feel a strong incentive to divide and separate yourself from other Christians, Remember the communion of saints. In Christ, you are not alone. And recognizing Christ in Christians brings unity. When the enemy tries to talk you into staying angry and holding on to every hurt with deep resentment and unforgiveness, then know that God provides inner heat and forgiveness. So the, the truth, the belt of truth, protects us. And the main truth is this. God loves you. And God shows you his love through relationship. Praying the word of God is a very powerful tool also. Understanding and living the word of God is quite powerful. So both draw on the power of God and not the power of man. So tonight we were reminded of the overall use of spiritual warfare, defense, protect, and destroy. We explored the righteousness of Jesus Christ and that the sacraments of baptism and reconciliation deliver his righteousness to us we were reminded that baptism remains always. And we also saw that the enemy longs for you to deny and reject it. The only way it can become penetrated. Praising God polishes and reconciliation removes the filth that accumulates so that it does not become so burdened with sin that you want to remove it because of its heaviness. Caked with personal sin and bitterness, it seems to be the problem instead of the solution. And as we talked about the benefits of guarding your heart with the breastplate of righteousness, you found your hope. The main truth is this, God loves you and he shows you his love through relationships. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. And then remember John 10.10. 10. The thief comes only to steal and slaughter and destroy. Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. 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 Very good.